Okay, uh, as you can see, position opened on Euro. It's a short position at 121.09. Okay, if you follow this trade, well done. We end the trade. So let's wait and see when, how long it will take until this pair will give us a profit. It's the messaging that matters. And you're seeing, you're seeing the herd here. On the way down, Novogratz looking dumb. On the way up, he is really, really smart today. Right now, a smart conversation with Joseph Weisenthal. What'd you miss? Anchor, which barely describes his path of watching Bitcoin. When was the first time you heard about Bitcoin? I think there was like a New York article, like in 20. 10 or something academic you know, like, article about that dismissed it thing, you know? yeah it's like kind of this weird thing i dismissed it dismissed it dismissed, oh well you know we're not I'm dismissing it now and as novogratz uh, uh mentions there all of a sudden corporations yeah. the rumor on apple picking up and using it as well what's the downside what's the risk for tesla or apple or any other corporation in I don't, accepting bitcoin I don't think there's much risk for a Tesla in any way. I mean, Tesla's entire reputation is about doing things that are in the future. And the whole story of one day we're going to be on Mars riding Tesla's recharging, paying in Bitcoin is just like part of this fantasy $1.5 billion. Is it a fantasy? I would guess. If I that that particular vision probably why isn't the all wound up this morning, folks? But this I is going to be good. Wrong. Let's extend this out to two hours. Okay, Francie wants to get in here, Joe, and let me let me be quick on this. The basic yeah. idea goes back to first principles. It's not legal tender. Right. It is hinged upon some algorithmic theory called proof of work. Yeah. How does Secretary Yellen address this? Finally, as it touches the commercial tendencies of this nation. You know, I do think actually we don't know what Yellen's stance towards Bitcoin is going to be. But I actually think maybe the industry should be anxious, and I'll give two reasons. One is energy consumption of the currency, and I think there are a lot of people in Yellen's orbit who are going to find that very uh, distasteful. Mm -hmm. And, frankly, I think that, uh, you know, obviously not Tesla or many other companies, but when you look at the mean, one of the things that Bitcoin can do is facilitate transactions between characters that the government might find to be unsavory in some way, even if that's not the majority of the action, again, I could see people in Yellen's orbit finding that a little worrisome. So I think so, there's going to be some interesting stuff happening. I have a million and one questions, Joe. So does it mean that it could actually be regulated to get rid of, you know, the dodgy investors that that have been in Bitcoin? No, I don't. I don't. I mean, I, I would say two things. Look, the exchanges in the custodial wallets, the companies that either facilitate buying that need access to the banking system in order to move dollars into Bitcoin and vice versa. Absolutely, they can be regulated. They currently are regulated. There's more potential regulations. But fundamentally, there's nothing stopping, you know, me from sending a Bitcoin to Tom or you in a manner such that no third party can block it or potentially even know about it. And that is inherently unregulatable. There is no nothing that anyone can do about that. So you can see perhaps attempts. Maybe they'll uh, be more strict in the future about moving your coins off exchange into a private wallet. Tension may emerge on that front. You may have people who are part of the investment industry who say, you know what, Bitcoin is a store of value and it's a form of gold. We don't need to uh, uh, be associated with uh, some of these dodgier characters. But these are fights and tensions that are going to keep happening, particularly as uh, more money enters the space. Joe, I know you're always like a step ahead or three years ahead of anyone else. You know, what could be the underlying reason for Elon Musk to be so keen on it? Is there, uh, there was a thread actually on um, Twitter yeah. that you urged everyone to read. <laughs> I mean, is there, you know, could he, could he mine it in space? Look, I don't think so. I, look, my main theory, and I'm being completely honest here, is that I think Elon is having a lot of fun, and that's my main theory. He's tweeting. It's fun to tweet about Bitcoin. It's fun to tweet about Dogecoin. Yeah, it's fun to tweet me. Elon's expense. It is. There is a potential expense if. Look, Bitcoin is extremely volatile. We know that even its most uh, uh, you know, ardent fans would have to admit that it's extremely volatile. And as such, there are, go at times, have been people who have bet a lot of money, put a lot of their money into it, only to see it fall. I mean, imagine if someone had got caught up near the peak of 2017, 
Granted, today it's uh, significantly higher than that, but it is volatile. People have money that they need to use. And so you are going to get in this situation, and we're kind of in this weird situation now where you have a lot of our, like, sort of, like, richest, most successful, most prominent people in finance and tech essentially encouraging speculation in a weird way. Uh, Cameron Kreis... Are they uh, encouraging criminal activity? No, I don't think so. I don't think uh, anyone's encouraging criminal activity. I think, though, that there is a sort of, like, it's in the air, this appetite for speculation. Lots of people are very fair, fair, uh, aggressively fair. promoting the idea that yeah. coins, digital coins of various natures are a, a smart investment. Maybe you can buy high-yield bonds with it as well. Joe Weisenthal, thank you so much. Really wonderful briefing there. He'll drive forward this conversation this afternoon, I am sure. Coming up on vaccines, coming up on the virus, coming up on your pandemic, I'm Esha Dalja of Johns Hopkins University. Stay with us, futures negative four. Joe Weisenthal's Bitcoin, 46,000. These solar arrays will, uh, that we're going to install are going to be about half the size of the existing solar arrays uh, that we have on the National Space Station. But because of the advances in technology over the years, they're going to provide uh, about twice the power in just half of the area that the existing solar arrays cover. any interest if President Biden invited you just to come and take a tour of the White House just to see what it looks like? If he wants to talk about how to empower people, boy, I would be there in a nanosecond. Rating revenues coming in better than expected. Everything cash. $1.4 trillion of cash. One of the most notable aspects of this report that was stellar. In Chinese and in English, a press conference for the World Health Organization, the sensitivities of being in Wuhan. It is an important symbol of the path to this pandemic, and we make note of it uh, this morning. Amish Adalja with us with Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. We're thrilled to have him on today. Amish, you're the adult in the room. What is the importance of the World Health Organization being in Wuhan? The importance is that we still don't understand the origin of this virus. We know what happened uh, in the early days, but we don't know completely when it started. We don't actually understand which animal this jumped from into humans. There was a lot of transparency questions, and, and I do think an independent investigation to try and understand what happened 
completely in those early days, even before the virus was identified, is very, very important because there's going to be another coronavirus outbreak. There's going to be another emergency, and we need to learn from this one mm -hmm. in order to prevent this from happening again. Does the new variants in the fears of various and sundry variants, does that fold back onto our knowledge of what happened in Wuhan? Not particularly, because the variants were going to occur no matter what happened, because this is a virus that mutates, all viruses mutate, and lots of different variants have been spun off since the very beginning. It's only a few that have reached kind of the headline status because they changed the function of the virus, made it more transmissible or made it a little bit more of a problem for, for vaccines. But the variants themselves just are what we would expect with any virus. The origin is a different issue. It's trying to understand what the intermediate animal was. So for SARS, it was the civet cat. For Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, it's camels. We don't know yet what it is for, for this virus. Image, what, what does it mean for vaccines? I mean, how quickly can you adapt a, a, a vaccine to actually deal with the, the variant? Actually, using the vaccine platform technologies that are exemplified by the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines, it's very easy to update the vaccine. They basically just have to, to make some changes into the code and you can basically have a new vaccine. That's the elegance of these mRNA vaccine platforms. They really are, are so easy to kind of plug and play. So I don't have a, any kind of concerns about not being able to update the vaccine. The question will be, do we need to do it? And I think we need to get more data specifically on the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines versus the South African variant, because it does seem that while Johnson & Johnson, Novavax, and AstraZeneca have some problems stopping symptomatic disease. The Pfizer and Moderna vaccines may be a little bit different using a different technology. And also, it's important to remember that even with these variants, our vaccines are very robust at protecting against what matters, serious disease, hospitalization, and death. Image, when you look at, you know, some of what's been happening in Europe, which is, the, you know, first of all, they're looking at various uses, for example, the first shot with one vaccine, the second shot with another. I mean, in combining some of these vaccines, could they actually be more efficient? That is the open question. We know that each vaccine works a little bit differently, stimulates your immune system in a separate manner. And could you kind of have a mix and match combination that's better than just using one vaccine? So I do think it's important to do these studies to optimize the ability of our immune system to fight off this, this uh, virus. I think it's also important that it be done in a controlled fashion and not just be done kind of without any insight into what's going on biologically. So I do think that, that the results of these trials are going to be important and may guide the future vaccine policy that we, we have against coronavirus. If you're joining us, Sam Eshadalja with Johns Hopkins University, as we see the World Health Organization in China delicately having a press conference. Amish, Johns Hopkins has all sorts of relationships with China, and you are in health security. Do you have an estimation of what Beijing wants out of this press conference, what Beijing wants out of the science of Wuhan? My my speculation would be that Beijing wants not to be uh, not to be surprised, not to be embarrassed, to be to get basically a, a stamp of approval from the World Health Organization. And I think this is one of the concerns people have had a long, for a long time with the World Health Organization in China, that we may not get a fully independent investigation. Remember that this is now over a year since the virus appeared. There was massive lack of transparency uh, that happened early on regarding person-to-person -person spread. They persecuted doctors who, who uh, announced the, the virus on, on bulletin boards and chat boards on, on the internet. So I think they don't want any of that to be brought up, and they want to be told that they did everything right. And I think that's why we probably need to have an independent investigation that is completely objective. But we may still never know exactly what happened in those early mm -hmm. days, because it's very hard to tell what, what would have happened there. And, and they had a lot of time to be able to massage the story a little bit. And I don't think it's something nefarious, but I think it's something that is going to be very hard to completely ascertain. Mm -hmm. Dr. Dalja, thank you so much. Honored to have you on with us as we observe uh, the press conference in uh, Wuhan. He is with the Johns Hopkins uh, University. As Francine mentioned, the yield on high yield, not full faith in credit sovereign, but in the IG market, there is a bid price up, yield down, and we particularly see that in high yield, a higher coupon, which has been driven down, price up, 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 yield down under 4%, and that truly is a hallmark going back on my chart to 1987. James Karen is with Morgan Stanley. He is the right person to speak to on this moment in fixed income. The compare and contrast 
to 2006 and 2007. Futures in negative five, down futures negative 50. Uh, Bitcoin off that 48,000 level with a 45,000 handle right now. Please stay with us. From London, from New York, another hour of Bloomberg Surveillance. to not only have a positive growth, but perhaps a somewhat more encouraging positive growth. The rebound in the second and third quarter will be quite strong because the expectation is that the vaccine will help clear the way. Okay, guys. I am going to place a stop on profit for Euro. So if you thought just a second, it's moved up. So I need to wait until we will reach 121.05. Well, we have all different brokers. So we use broker in order to trade. So basically, uh, the broker gives us four, sometimes five pips of spread. So I need to get, in order to play stop and profit, I need for price to move a little bit away from the price uh, I purchased. Security. Okay, done. So I'm placing a stop on profit at 121.07. We'll have two pips in profit. So nothing will change. Uh, if the pair will change its direction, it will get filled at 121.07 and we will end up in profit okay speak to you later guys How about a market check with trillions in anticipated stimulus, assets rise, stocks, well, they churn this morning. Expectations of inflation, they uh, churn too. First Tesla, next Apple, Bitcoin to the moon. The vaccine, well, and the dollar sterling advances. The pound strengthens against a less vaccinated Europe. An impeachment too, the former president claims free speech and the very fact he is the former. Good morning, everyone. Bloomberg Surveillance, Tom Keen in New York, Francine Lacroix in London. Francine, 137 sterling, some real strength there. Do you buy like what John Farrow talks about, where it's just you're getting vaccination right and Europe is not? Well, it's not about what Pharaoh says. It's really what the market is looking at. And there are two things. First of all, Tom, it's very clear that the market is discounting negative rates. So that's something that's out of the way. We had a great conversation also with Elza Lignos. And if you look at the rates of speed at which people are getting vaccinated, yeah. and this is what the markets are pointing to, compared, frankly, to any country in Europe, but also the U.S., the U.K. is going at light speed. I think, uh, you know, we've moved on to <clears throat> at least getting the first, you know, the first dose to um, above 50s in two months. 
months. However, you know this is about the long game, Tom, because of uh, mutations and variations. So I would suggest wait and see over a six-month horizon. But for the moment, it's still powering ahead with vaccination, and that's supporting uh, pound strength. And of course, you see it in the markets yesterday, out to record highs in stocks as well. Looking at impeachment in Washington, Mr. Cirilli will join us uh, here in a moment. Futures negative six. With our Bloomberg First Word News in New York, is Ritika Gupta. Morning, Tom Francine. There's never been a day like this in the Senate. Donald Trump faces an unprecedented second impeachment trial beginning today. It will start with a debate on whether the proceeding is constitutional. Then tomorrow, the House impeachment managers and Trump's defense team each will begin up to 16 hours of presentations. The former president is virtually assured of acquittal. It would take a two-thirds majority to get a conviction. And House Democrats want to limit the next round of stimulus checks to households earning less than $200,000. That's after criticism that President Biden's $1.9 trillion proposal would benefit the rich. The Republicans want stricter limits on who should get the $1,400 checks. And in Myanmar, tens of thousands of protesters took to the street for a fourth day. They demonstrated against last week's military coup. The new regime declared martial law and its deployed troops and water cannons in Myanmar's capital, Yangon. And Bitcoin kept rising today after soaring over the $48,000 level for the first time. Tesla revealed that it had bought $1.5 billion of the world's largest digital currency. The company also said it would accept Bitcoin as a form of payment for its electric cars. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Tom. Uh, thanks so much, Riddick. I'm going to walk through the yield space right now and do the bond calculation. 1.15% on the nominal 10-year uh, yield. You look at the residual, the 10-year the, uh, tip, and that's a negative 1.06. That has really come back, which tells you you've got some higher inflation expectations over the last uh, couple of days. Not really seen in dollar. Francine, I'd note gold, 18.45 the ounce, up $11. Yeah, the thing I'm, I'm most focused on, Tom, is really the average yield on U.S. junk bonds dropping below 4%. I know, you know, we decided to look at the measure for the Bloomberg Barclays U.S. Corporate High Yield Index, which you have on your screen, dipping to 3.96%, making it six straight sessions of declines. Now, that goes back, of course, to uh, what we're seeing overall, but, you know, in the reflation trade, but the lower yields should encourage more speculative-grade companies maybe to tap the market after raising more than $7 billion last week. And you know, the, the, we haven't spent enough time actually to look at the repercussions this could have in the future, Tom. Very good. On a day of impeachment, Kevin Cirilli joins us, our chief Washington uh, correspondent. Kevin, it seems to be a difference between impeachment one and impeachment two of the use of video to relive January 6th. And of course, the defense for the former president will use video in their own way as well. David Kirkpatrick and Mike McIntyre in the New York Times today pull from the Michigan legislature and the scenes of rifles and guns and that in the Michigan legislature over to January 6th. Is that what the Democrats are going to do? Yes. And look, I, I think I've got three takeaways in terms of the conversations that I had yesterday with sources throughout Please. the day regarding the impeachment. The first is virtually no chance of acquittal. The second is, if you're watching the Democrats, uh, look to see how centrist Democrats and, and serious Democrats, especially those on the intelligence committees and, and uh, other committees of that caliber, how they're going to, to, to plant seeds for nonpartisan issues mm -hmm. about how to stamp out ex domestic extremism and terrorism uh, from the United States. Thirdly, and this is important, watch to see the policymakers in the Senate and the Republican Party who are jockeying at an early start for president in 2024 to see where they lay down their markers. Senator Pat is not running uh, for re-election in 2022 in the state of Pennsylvania, but as a Republican, he has been at the forefront, Tom, of really leading the criticism charge of former President Trump's involvement in January 6th, but also uh, trying to temper expectations and say, essentially, that that there is virtually no chance of acquittal, taking a legal argument and saying that <clears throat> many Republicans feel, right. un, uh, feel uneasy with the fact of convicting someone who's out of office. Okay, so Richard Shelby, like Toomey, exiting yep. out the door, a glorious 86 years old, making the right decision. Where will Shelby, where will Toomey, 
Where will Rand Paul, Senator Paul, where do they come down on this militia attachment to the Republican Party, which was clearly evident January 6th, whatever anyone's politics? I, I remember back to conversations that I had in the last Congress with Congressman, former Congressman Denver Riggleman, a Republican of Virginia, deeply rural district, uh, in which he lost to uh, an upstart uh, far-right uh, uh, candidate. And uh, you know, in a primary, uh, but but he comes from the cyber intelligence uh, background, and and the issue of QAnon, the issue of what we've seen play out uh, with freshman Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, and the criticism that she has received, not just from Democrats, but also to some extent from some Republicans. You're looking in real time at the uneasiness uh, of of, of uh, uh, Congresswoman Liz Cheney and trying to navigate through uh, the new Republican Party landscape. Look, there's a power vacuum in the Republican Party right now. And as a result of that, that's why when I talk to sources, they don't, on the right, they don't know who to be looking to to take their cues from. Right. And Kevin, good morning from London as well. I mean, I guess the point is, is, is this impeachment process, given the low probability of conviction, actually much more about understanding who's in charge of the Republican Party right now yeah. than really convicting Donald Trump? I would even go one step further. I agree with that. I, I would go one step further and say it's also a, a foreshadowing of who's going to be leading the, the Republican Party uh, into the midterm election cycles. Donald Trump Jr. told Politico just uh, yesterday uh, or the other day or maybe over the weekend uh, but uh, that that he's going to be uh, campaigning against Congresswoman Cheney uh, in, in a primary district and he's vowing to to, uh, to, to endorse candidates uh, from the Trump era uh, for, for in primary. But beyond that, this broader issue that Tom, and I, and I think this is really crucial, this broader issue of extremism and the internet is really something that unfortunately is not unique to the United States. We've seen it play out in the UK. We've seen it play out across Europe. And, and it's going to be up to a bipartisan coalition yeah. to try to change the rules of the road to make sure that that doesn't take foothold. I mean, talking about militias is something that we haven't seen yet, Kevin, with all due respect, in the UK. But, you know, is it just testing the strength of the US institutions? Well, I think that the institutions process, and hardly am I suggesting, Francine, that there was an attack similar to here, but the issue of extremism on the internet is, is universal. And so uh, I, I think the issue of the institutions, the process has played out, right? I mean, we're watching the process play out right now uh, of an impeachment process and a trial, the article of impeachment that had been brought over uh, from the House of Representatives uh, to the Senate, and, and that is a constitutional uh, uh, process, and that process is playing out. Mm -hmm. Yesterday at the White House, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki uh, telling reporters in the Brady briefing room uh, that uh, President Biden will be uh, paying somewhat of an attention to this, but that he is largely uh, going to leave it to the constitutional process and the institutions of Congress uh, to, to navigate through this. Uh, you know, I, I look, Kevin, at where we are. What's the timeline here? I mean, how many days are we going to have this? I think in, in terms of the opening arguments, I think it'll last all day today. Uh, I, I would base, you know, and I was talking to a source yesterday, I think at least for the next couple of days, uh, impeachment's going to be uh, carrying through here. Uh, but as it relates to uh, the, the other big story, which is, you know, GameStop hearing this week on Capitol Hill, uh, you've got uh, the mm -hmm. $1.9 trillion stimulus talks. But this is going to be drowning out a lot of the, the well, mainstream oxygen from politics, but there's a lot of other issues well, happening. Kevin, thank you so much. Terrific brief. Thank Kevin you. Cirilli there thank with you. great, great perspective, our chief Washington correspondent. Back to the markets, Francine, you note the Italian yield, it just comes in and in and in. It's a draggy rally. It, it is, Tom. I love, I mean, some of our quotes, I have to say, you know, officials have been speaking to our reporters on the ground, and this is uh, Prime Minister-designate Mario Draghi, which is, you know, seemingly trying to put together these warring political factions, and he's succeeding. And our reporters asked him, so why is he succeeding when so many failed before him? And the official just responded, it's Draghi. Uh, the yield on the 10-year government debt falling to 0.5 percent, that, of course, drops below Unreal. the previous low set last month. So something to keep an eye on, Tom. The future 
futures are negative 8, Dow futures are negative 77. On the political discussion, fair and balanced on the Democrat side, well, the gentleman from Maryland, Benjamin Cardin, uh, will join David Weston and also James Comer, the Republican, uh, as well. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. were actually better at controlling the deaths from COVID-19. Do you think out of this pandemic, we'll see more countries be willing to elect female leaders? And when we look at women leaders, we tend to project on them baggage that they shouldn't bear. Women are given an opportunity when no one else wants to do the job. Women had a very clear objective. Uh, they wanted to save lives. The women leaders... If you look at their careers, I've also... Okay, traders, uh, I'm moving uh, my stop on profit further. So if you follow my trades and if you sold short euro, please do, please move your stop on profit. You pips down. So basically you will get more profit. Yep. So I'm going to move to 121.04. Case. So we'll have five pips in profit. Speak to you later, guys. So it's not a fad that we are using it in all aspects of our lives for work, for learning, for communicating, for staying in touch. Bloomberg surveillance, terrific news flow this morning. Francine Lacroix in London. I'm Tom Keen uh, in New York. We need a chart. Let's look at a chart. It could be any chart Always. on yield, yield, yield. In this case, the Bloomberg Barclays, down it goes. Great moderation of high yield. It is extraordinary. And all you need to know is down we go with the spike of Volcker. And the spike that we saw long ago in far away, say 10 years, and we are at new low, low yields. Someone who has this tattooed to the brain is James Karen with Morgan Stanley. We're thrilled that Jim Karen could join us uh, this morning. Is it like 2006? Um, I wouldn't say it's like 2006, only because there's much more, well, let's call it market interference. We have QE right now in a, in a, in a bigger way. So in 2006, it was much more over leveraged. And I think actual risk in the financial system and the banks have been re-regulated in a very different way. So what was pushing yields lower back then, or at least spreads tighter back then, had a lot more to do with leverage in the system and probably banks taking on too much risk. What this is essentially is quantitative easing. And, and, and essentially, you had mentioned earlier in the show that 10-year real yields are at minus 1.05, 1.06%. So that means if you're a fixed-income investor and you want a positive real yield, yep. you have to start to look towards credit. And if you want a higher positive real yield, you have to go down the credit spectrum and look at high-yield mm -hmm. bonds, which might give you close to 4%. And Jim, you know there can be mean reversion, and when it goes against you, it is mean, mean reversion. How likely, I mean, how are you managing for the mean, mean reversion you know is coming? Yeah, so, so, so this is a good question, right, because it's really about how we put together and construct a portfolio. It's easy to say, hey, there's this reflation theme. The Fed's going to keep rates low. Let's just take a whole bunch of risk and buy high yield and get as much as we can out of this. But then on the other hand, what if that doesn't work out so well? And, you know, what if we do need higher quality bonds? So really the only way to hedge against this is to construct a portfolio that does have good diversification and that you own some high quality, which means that you might give up some of the upside if high yield yields 
fall quite a bit and the bond prices rise, you know, substantially. Um, but on the other hand, you're able to at least stabilize this. And you can also look at shorter term uh, assets as well. So you can look at CLOs, you can look at bank loans. I mean, this is basically the same trade, except it's with a, with a shorter duration. So there are different things that you can do, but diversification is the way that you're going to hedge this. But Jim, th this would only apply for basically investors with sufficient liquidity. Yeah, that's right. Um, you know, so if, if you're an individual, the bond market, I think, can be a very difficult thing to just sort of buy one or two of these things and, and hope that you're diversified. And, and, and look, I mean, the other thing that it also enables a more sophisticated investor to do is go underweight or short U.S. Treasuries if you think yields are rising there, that you may be able to underweight your holdings in U.S. Treasuries and overweight some holdings in credit and create uh, and, and reduce your duration risk that way. But you're absolutely right. Princey. This is not um, something to be done by, you know, amateurs. This is more of a professional's game. So, Jim, what happens after this? It feels like every, you know, asset class is getting impacted. And, you know, once this trade has kind of run its course, what's next? Do you go to Bitcoin? Do you go to, you know, <laughs> it, it, what's left after this? So, uh, so, so I, th I think it's interesting the timeline, right? Because here we are, we're at the start of 2021, and we're talking about a massive amount of stimulus. We're talking about uh, a central bank of Fed that is going to be very supportive and try to keep yields as low as it can and is not going to hike interest rates for a while. But at some point, as you say, and, and the question is, what is that some point? Is it 2023? Is it 2024? Is it the end of 2022? This is what the market's debating. And I do think that when rates start to rise, that this is going to create some turbulence in the markets for sure, because interest rates are low. And as you pointed out, even some of the lower credit quality bond yields are also very low, that this could be somewhat disruptive. Now, I don't like to say the words taper tantrum back like, like, like what we saw in 2013, but the fear of many of the policymakers is that if they keep pressuring yields lower, that essentially what ends up happening is that you increase the risk that there could be a rush to the exit at some point. And the point is, is to make that exit door you know, wide enough right. that enough people can get out slowly enough that it doesn't create a, a big disruption. Oh, yeah. Let's see if they can do it successfully. <laughs> Sounds like Bitcoin, Jim Karen. Jim, help me with the partial differentials of nominal yield, less inflation expectations, over to a real yield, the residual here. Which of those partial differentials would you focus on? So the, the way that I measure stimulus right now in the in, in the market is that real yield. If I were to look at one thing. You go so to I the residual. I'm, I was just going to say, I, in, in some ways I go to the residual. And the reason I say that is, well, we have to, as, as you pointed out, you've got the nominal 10-year Treasury yield, and then you have inflation expectations. The nominal 10-year Treasury yield is being managed by the Fed. That's quantitative easing, and they're not really allowing it to rise very much. There are no bond vigilantes anymore. So as there's more and more stimulus, you increase the inflation expectations, and you push down that real yield. So when we look at reflation, oddly, what we have to look at is real yields continuing to go lower. So when you get asked the question, is stimulus working? Is the reflation trade working? We have to we have to look at real yields and say, are those real yields continuing to stay low, or are they going even lower further? And then that's what makes high yield attractive yeah. at high yield assets attractive at sub 4% levels is that differential yeah. and even with equities you know when i look at equity yields i'm going to look at equity yields versus 10 year real yields and i'm going to take the difference between the two and that's what i'm no. that's where i'm going to draw my valuation line there is your clinic today global wall street from professor karen unfortunately his bonus is to continue with us and we'll uh, we'll try to stay away from calculus it's way too early in the morning for calculus jim karen of morgan State Stanley with us, and we will uh, continue. Someone listening, no doubt, Robert Kaplan. This is an important interview, really, really timely. Or Michael McKee with a gentleman from Dallas. Look for that in the 8 o'clock hour. Futures negative 8, Dow futures at negative 77. Stay with us. Where's Bitcoin? Karen demands, I quote, Bitcoin, 46,000, up a little bit. This is Bloomberg. Good morning.
一个就是我们看中它的那个品牌吧，它品牌就是说东西比较干净嘛，然后比较方便的话，味道也还可以的话，我觉得我会考虑吧。外卖的话呢，也也是一种方式，就是品种会多一点嘛，各各有它的特点吧。这个车的话，目前我们是通过这个手机 APP 扫，就手机扫码，然后微信和这个支付宝扫我们这个车上的这个二维码，大家就可以进入到一个小程序的这个界面，然后呢，可以选购自己喜欢的商品，然后付款之后呢，这个柜门会自动打开。支付成功，请拉开右侧车门取货，并关紧柜门。然后我们会取餐，然后完了之后呢，就把餐这个柜门关上，然后整个购买的这个流程就会结束。You can keep an eye on Japanese yen. If you like to place an order, because we do, and I'm placing an order for sell short Japanese yen at 104.697. Just right here. Okay, order place. So if you're looking to sell short Japanese yen, this is your time. 104.697. Only from Bloomberg. Start exploring to see what's moving the markets. Visit Bloomberg.com webinars. Hi, I'm David Weston. Bloomberg Television is reinventing one of the most iconic brands in financial television for a new audience. Join me to see the news program for the clever investor. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. I'm Rishka Gupta with the Bloomberg Business Flash. Nissan has trimmed its loss outlook for the fiscal year. It's a sign the beleaguered Japanese automaker is starting to recover from the worst of the coronavirus pandemic's impact. Nissan is now expecting a net loss of $5.1 billion. The company is in the midst of a turnaround plan that involves cutting production capacity by about a fifth. Reddit is rising a wave of attention after users of the social media site drove a stock market frenzy. The company says it has raised $250 million in a round led by Ivy Capital. The funding gives Reddit a valuation of $6 billion. And for the first time ever, the average yield on the U.S. junk bond fell below 4%. Investors seeking a haven from ultra-low interest rates. We opened position on Japanese yen. You can see that it's a short position. So we sold short at 104.697. Really good, thanks so much. I'll turn right now to the markets. Negative eight on the futures, Dow futures negative 73, but just everything easing away. On the 30 year bond, 2%, we saw 1.93% right now. Gold higher. Fencing? Uh, Tom, I'm looking at, um, you know, European stocks, are, they're kind of slipping, but after the last couple of days, they're just pausing for breath is the narrative on the markets. Um, yeah. They're trying to figure out some of the earnings, also weighing the impact of rising inflation expectations with stocks at record highs. So this is a continuation of the reflation trade. And really, we did spend a little bit of time looking at yield on U.S. junk bond and that index below 4% for the first time. I have it there. We're looking at through the Barclays U.S. corporate index. And if you look at that, it, they're just a lot of questions, and I'm really glad that uh, Jim Karen is staying with us to make a bit more sense about this risk appetite um, and what that means for investors turning to risky debt in this relentless yield hunt. Mm -hmm. Now, coming up on Bloomberg Markets, so we'll be talking to Richard Zoget, the Citigroup Managing Director and Head of Global Debt Capital Markets. That's coming up a little bit later today, 11.30 a.m. in New York, 4.30 p.m. in London. Tom, I'm also looking at uh, like record low yield for Italian BTPs. This is on the back of the premier designate, Mario Draghi, finding a solution amongst warring political parties. This is Bloomberg.
is focusing on is um, not so much what goes inside the cars of the future. Um, so they're not working on doing a, a self-driving car or an autonomous vehicle um, themselves, but rather they're focusing on the surroundings. So everything that's going to go on um, outside the vehicle in the future. So that's um, you know sensors, cameras, radars that are uh, embedded into roads, street signs, traffic lights, bus stops. Um, you know, infrastructure that's going to provide information, something to help the, the vehicle know what's going on around it, um, to help it, you know, stay on schedule if it's a bus or avoid other vehicles, avoid accidents, uh, provide information about weather conditions, uh, potential hazards down the road and so forth. Our generation's biggest problem. Climate change is happening. And the world's most innovative solutions. Transport, industry, uh, buildings, electricity, all of those things. Everything you need to know about our changing environment. The politics of global warming. We can and we will deal with climate change. In the fight against climate change, Bloomberg Green has you covered. Valuations, particularly, you know, sort of the technology landscape, have gotten to some pretty extraordinary uh, levels. Uh, so I think it's, it's not a surprise. I don't think it's any indication of the beginning of the end, but I do think markets don't like uncertainty. Trading revenue is coming in better than expected. Everything cash, $1.4 trillion of cash. One of the most notable aspects of this report that was stellar. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, Tom and Francine from London and New York. Now, we were having a good conversation about uh, coupons and uh, high-yield uh, junk bonds. Uh, let's get back to Jim Karen Morgan Stanley, Investment Management, Fixed Income Portfolio Manager. Jim, we were speaking about Bitcoin. I got love messages. I got hate messages on Twitter. We're not sure whether we're coming and going. What's your take on Bitcoin? So, you know, it's an interesting medium right now. And full disclosure, we don't invest in it in, in any of our portfolios. But, you know, when I think about it and you know, when I see it, I, I see it as an alternative store or value that people consider it to be that way. I take no position on whether it is or not. But the one thing I can't take my eyes off is the fact that it keeps going up. And I think that's what's attracting uh, it to so many people. If it were going down, I don't think it would be as attractive. But the fact that it just continues to trend higher is it, it does make some people think that this could be. A, a hedging or a diversifying instrument within their portfolios. So I think it's interesting, but really what the backstory is behind a lot of this is that we're seeing a lot of money printing from central banks. We're seeing a lot of quantitative easing. We're looking at money supply um, measures rise quite a bit, and people are just looking for something else. And right now that's filling the spot. Jim, when you look at the stimulus debate in the U.S., I mean, very few people say that the U.S. doesn't need a stimulus. I guess it's the size and how you make it targeted or not. D does this go back as an investor to the only question you need to get right this year is whether we're going to see you know, sustainable inflation? Yeah, that is the question. I think you can divide the universe of investors into two groups and those who believe that inflation will be a problem and those that don't. I think everybody agrees that we need some stimulus. It's just always a question of how it gets directed and very, very importantly, what the fiscal multiplier of that stimulus is. So when we look at a nominal package, say Biden's 1.9 trillion package, and probably less than that is going to be what's passed, maybe 1.4 or 1.5 trillion. But the number that we really need to know is what's the fiscal multiplier? How much of that turns into GDP? It's not one for one. Is the number 0 0.5? Is it 0 0.2? So it's really about how it gets spent and also how it gets directed. Is it more spending or is it more investing? If it's a one-off fiscal transfer, then in 2022, what we're going to start to see is a lot of fiscal tightening. Because unless we see the same amount of fiscal spending in 2022 as what we're seeing right now, then what you're going to see in 2022, if there's less fiscal spending, is a fiscal tightening. And the market's going to be worried about that, too. So whatever gets spent now has to pay dividends into the future and as soon as next year and the year after that um, for the markets to really accept this as something more than just a one-off fiscal transfer. And that is what the debate is right now. We all agree that we need some stimulus. These are hard times. But 
it's really a measure of, of what kind of stimulus are we getting, how it gets directed, and ultimately, from an economics perspective, what the fiscal multiplier of that is. And more attention needs to be paid to that part of the argument. So what does that mean, Jim, given all of these unknowns, how you want to construct your portfolio? Well, what we do know, uh, at least over the next 12 months, is that there is going to be a lot of fiscal stimulus. If this is a plan right now that's being discussed, um, you know, currently there's going to be another fiscal stimulus plan probably in the third quarter, fourth quarter that's also going to come. So the markets are getting flooded with a lot of liquidity. Uh, the consumer is getting a significant amount of, of, of money as well. So consumer balance sheets are good. Consumer credit is very, very good. Um, so asset-backed securities, mortgage is we think the consumer is going to be in really good shape that and the fact that the vaccines and that the and that the uh, number of cases of covid are going down at this point this sets us up for a boom in the second quarter we're looking at 10 11 percent gdp growth potentially in the second quarter so what's in front of us is is a, is, is probably a lot of pent-up demand and a lot of economic activity so we need to get through that and we need and, and this is all good news and now we have to then see how sustainable is this? Do, does hiring really start? Do we get the unemployment rate back to full employment? That's the goal. That's what Janet Yellen's talking about. That's what the Fed is talking about, is, is getting back to full employment. So these are the things that it's yet to be seen, but so far early days is that we have enough stimulus to probably give us a bit of a boom in economic activity for 2021. We'll start to worry about 2022 starting around mid-year to say, is this gonna sustain itself? or will we be dealing with fiscal tightening in 2022 just by virtue of the fact that there will be less stimulus in 2022 versus 2021? Um, Jim, give, so given all of this, what do you do with emerging markets? So I, so I like emerging markets. Uh, you know, I, I think that what we're also getting is, is, is global growth as well. And you're also seeing energy prices rise. You're seeing commodity prices rise. I think the dollar may not be, uh, you know, falling aggressively right now, but we do think that the dollar will fall pretty precipitously going towards the end of the year. All of these things boost commodity prices, ease global financial conditions. Emerging markets that have higher real yields, we were talking about negative real yields in the U.S., a lot of emerging markets have positive real yields, and they have steeper curves. For a fixed income investor, this allows you to add some duration to buy some good you know, bonds in areas that are more high beta to the global economic recovery. Global growth is expected to be around 6 6.5% in 2021. This should really be um, a tailwind for emerging markets. So, so we like emerging markets. We continue to add to positions very, very selectively there. And even looking at some of the higher beta emerging markets as well that are more levered to global growth start to look pretty interesting. And also those who um, have energy complexes as well also start to look relatively interesting as well. Thank you so much. Jim Karen there of Morgan Stanley Investment Management joining us this morning for a spirited conversation. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News. Here's Ritika Gupta. Hi, Ritika. Hi, Francine. It's a trial where the verdict is almost preordained. The unprecedented second impeachment trial of Donald Trump begins today in the Senate. He's almost certain to be acquitted. 67 votes are needed to convict. That would mean 17 Republicans crossing party lines to vote with the 50 Democrats. Proceedings begin today with a vote on whether the impeachment trial itself is constitutional. And President Biden is set to ask 56 U.S. attorneys appointed by the Trump administration to resign. That's a standard process for a new administration. Two of the federal prosecutors will be asked to stay on because they're working on politically sensitive cases. One is an investigation into the pres president's son, Hunter. And the fast-spreading coronavirus variant found in the UK has now found a foothold in Florida. That's prompted concerns about fans who flooded the streets of Tampa after Sunday's Super Bowl. Florida leads the US in confirmed cases of the known variant as B117 with 201 infections. And in China, a sign that the birth rate keeps declining. The number of newborn babies registered with the police fell by almost 15% last year. China's population is aging more quickly than most of the world's developed economies. The Communist Party has signaled it's willing to further relax birth restrictions. Global News 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg Francine. Ritika, thank you so much. Now, coming up on Balance of Power, infectious disease specialist Dr. Celine Gounder, a former advisor to President Joe Biden's 
COVID transition team. We'll ask, of course, about variations and vaccines. This is Bloomberg. Has enhanced search on the terminal to deliver what you need when you need it. Now, you can simply type phrases in everyday English in the command line. Compare financials. Find people. Analyze markets. You can enter phrases or ask questions. What do you want to know today? Ask a question or visit SearchGo to find answers now. Surveillance, Francine Lacroix in London. I'm Tom Keen uh, in New York right now and well timed with Bloomberg opinion, always controversial, is Ramesh Panaru to join us on this day of impeachment. And I, I'm thrilled that he's with us because of an essay a year and a half ago where Ramesh Panaru walked through the evangelical church, the GOP, the future of the GOP, and brought in there sort of around. Lansing, Michigan, the militia as associated with so much of the GOP. All of that descends down on January 6th and what we see this morning with the second impeachment. Ramesh, tell me about the state of the GOP and the power of the GOP that believes in linking in almost a 19th century sense of militia and evangelicalism. Well, I think that the Republican Party um, under President Trump, former President Trump, has been increasingly flirting with political violence and tolerance for political violence. You can see that in Trump's rhetoric from the very, very beginning of his time in the national political stage. And this links up, of course, with existing strains of uh, anti-government and uh, sort of paranoid, apocalyptic fervor on the right. You saw that in the militia movement in the mid 1990s. Okay, guys, and this is how you trade euro. Position closed at 121.04. So all of you guys who place a stop on profit, you made a profit from your trade. Okay, well done close just right here it took you how long it took you way open position at about 10 40 and right now 11 40 in one hour made a profit well done creation of legislators that this kind of thing could lead to and then, of course, it is part of the reason why Republicans are going to be split on this question and, and why most Republicans are 
going to side with President Trump. Now, there are lots of other reasons for it as well, but certainly the level of fear of political repercussions. And we've seen reports that in the House vote on impeachment a few weeks ago that there were legislators who were afraid of physical repercussions, that they would be targeted for violence and intimidation if they voted against the president. So, Ramesh, if the Republican Party, and good morning from London, is no longer the, the party for law and order, what is it? Well, I think the Republican Party is trying to figure out what it is going to be and doesn't have a very strong sense of what it is anymore. President Trump, I think, really overthrew the previous definition of what a Republican is, but didn't quite replace it. And now, as he has left office, um, I think Republicans are sort of disoriented and trying to figure out what they're going to stand for. And this moment of the impeachment trial is going to be one of the moments where that redefinition takes place. So, Ramesh, I mean, you know, we're talking about semantic. This is, you know, as you say, it's basically, you know, the main argument against the impeachment and removal is that he hasn't, Donald Trump, broken any criminal statute. How, how does this get re reformed? I mean, is there someone going to look at the impeachment process and, you mm -hmm. know, the spirit in which it was put in place for it to change for the future? So I, I would say, actually, the main argument, that we're, and we're, the argument we're going to hear today is that it's not constitutional to convict president who's no longer in office. You know, impeachment has been successfully invoked once in American history when Nixon resigned rather than be impeached and convicted. Uh, the bar in the Constitution for a conviction is very high. It requires two-thirds of the Senate after a majority of the House. Given partisanship, that's very, very hard to reach. Uh, and it may be a flaw in the constitutional design because the founders didn't really foresee the emergence of the party system that happened actually pretty rapidly after they after we started. Um, but it's in the Constitution. It's going to be very, very hard to change that. And so uh, what we have to do, I think, is come up with, uh, with norms and institutions of presidential accountability um, that don't require that extreme.